bottom line, I I know that we're in this this fourth stage of the cycle right now. That's where we are. And I know that. So do I need to look at some of the other cycles? Not really, because it won't make any difference for me to put my energy into it. But what will make a difference is looking into the different crisis periods, the different crises, and then looking at those overlaps and seeing how they're going to come together and what might happen as a result. Hey, and good afternoon, everyone. Today, Neil McCoy Ward. We're going to discuss things that are happening right now, how these problems might affect you directly, and then some solutions so you can protect yourselves, your families, and get ready for these changes that are coming in so swift, all encompassing, but it's going to happen in a blink of an eye. Because can you remember January 1st, 2022, Happy New Year, just a few months back? Well, these changes we're talking about are going to happen that quickly. Everything we talk about today, at least on my end, in the very first step into what, what I would consider uh, a reset of our society, not in the Klaus Schwab way, but literally a reset based on disposable income, food pricing, energy prices. This affects everybody directly. What you eat, what your kids eat, what your family has access to in the supermarkets. We'll be here no later than the end of September, no first week of October. So if we trace that out, we're looking at about five months. And we discussed a little bit before what we wanted to cover. So I think it's just going to be an easy conversation with some solutions. Mm-hmm. So everybody kick back, enjoy. And then, you know, we are going to discuss the problem first, but we're not going to go in the fear, the doom and the gloom. That's not what this is about. It's understanding the problem and be able to find some solutions. So Neil, thank you and welcome. So let me pick your brain on your, when you visited these other countries in turmoil, mm. did the communities pull together to be able to work through these issues or did they just stratify and it was everybody on their own one, every man for themselves, every family for themselves, or did they organize into really tight knit social structures that, you know, could you know, move through what we're talking about in this yeah. last hour? So it's a little bit of both. And it's a good question because I've never even thought about that. So as you were asking, I was thinking through it. And we could use, say, Afghanistan or Iraq or some other places as an example. Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Kurdistan, all these sort of places, they're very tribal regions. So what you tend to have is a very strong community where people do band together, they do work together. But then you will have, say, uh, and again, let's move out of those countries, but you you will have the gangs and the gangs are not part of the community. They are in it for themselves. They are in it to survive and they will do whatever they need to do to get what they want. And the the name of the game for most of those is violence and um, doing some nasty stuff in order to scare and intimidate so people just give up what they what they have. So that's why it's good that you mentioned community because it is important to have that community to be able to band together because that's where the protection is. It doesn't matter if you are an SAS or a Navy SEAL with, you know, you've done every survival course and you've got all your different weapons and, you know, you're an expert in martial arts and whatever. If you, and I say this to my wife sometimes as well, if let's say you had, five or six guys that just rush the house in the middle of the night when you're asleep, it doesn't make any difference. You are just, you know, that that's, that's where community comes in. And that's where, you know, uh, I don't want to go too much into the prepping here because it's not really a lot of, you know, my, my sort of angle that I often talk about, I I focus on economics, but yeah, you, you can set up all sorts of different things. Um, radio networks, uh, walkie-talkie networks, and all the other stuff that you've got that community in case there are in a a scenario like that, which I've seen when you get these marauding groups, because if they come through, you don't really stand much of a chance. It's a bit like the, the military as well. Why do the military exercise troops, why do they throw them into small conflicts? it's so that they get what's known as battle hardened. 
So you probably heard this in war game theory and some other things. You want troops that are battle hardened because if you throw in troops that are super fit and super strong and they've got no experience and they go up against someone who uh, maybe isn't fit or strong, but they've got five years of experience and three of those years have been, you know, actually doing something. It doesn't make any difference how fit and strong those guys are. They are going to get absolutely destroyed. So this is another concept to think about. And then that takes us on to, okay, obviously there's a breakdown in the economy at that point where you're talking about you know, regional areas. What Did you see tradables? Did you see people bartering or what were the main barter items? You know, walk this out through, I know in the Western nations, it's going to be a little bit different, but obviously people function the same. They have the same hard wiring. I need this. I could trade you for that. Did you actually see that going on instead of using yeah. a cash basis for trade? Well, you'll be surprised by this, but in almost every single country, it was US dollars. <laughs> yeah, I thought that might take you by surprise. It was US dollars. Didn't matter which country I was in, I always had US dollars. Um, that is what people use. Now, you've got to think about what if the US dollar in however many years in the future, uh, I mean, it's strengthening at the moment, it's something called the DXY, and it's strengthening at the moment, which is quite a contrarian theory because a lot of people thought, it wouldn't and that it would weaken, but it's strengthening. But let's say that in the future, and, and it's inevitable, the US dollar will collapse. It's just, is it in a year? Is it in five years? It is it 50 years, 100 years? Who knows? But every fiat currency goes to zero. And in fact, this is a really good point, transition point, because I have here with me, I always have on my desk currency from all sorts of different periods. Oh, those are the Confederate Florida notes, huh? They are Confederate. That's right. I also have colonial and revolutionary currency. Just be very careful with these. I have as well this, which was sent to me by a subscriber. That is a the Reichsbank note from 1922, uh, 10,000 marks. Now, just one year later, this is how fast it collapsed. We had ein billion marks, which is actually one tri trillion marks in uh, in German, as someone corrected me on, because I thought it was a billion marks, actually a trillion marks. And then someone sent me again, a subscriber made these as a joke. One was an American, and this is one trillion dollars, and this one is euros. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. And, and again, I have currency here. I, I always have currency with me. And this is euros and pounds and dollars and whatever else. But I, I keep it here as a, as a reminder with this other note because it's not real money. It is just fiat currency. And it exists somewhat like a brand. So if you think of why one brand is more popular than another, yeah, some of it will be quality. But a lot of it will be how it exists in your mind. And people think of US dollars around the world as amazing and very valuable and things like that. Whereas if I showed them a gold coin versus US dollars or a silver coin like this, they're not interested. And I've done these social experiments. They are not interested. They want the paper. So it's interesting. But in the face of a, a complete breakdown, whenever that happens in the future, and I'm not really seeing it in, you know, the immediate, immediate term, but I think in the future, yeah, you always see these cycles where you have a major breakdown. Uh, look at the dark ages, you know, 1348, we had the, the Black Plague, wiped out half of Europe's population. 1381 was the Serfs Revolt. Um, you know, we go through these, these stages, these cycles in history all the time. It's just part of it's just part of life. But then what do you always go back to? You go back to this stuff. People always go back to gold and silver. And that's why actually one of my largest holdings is in precious metals, because I know from 1970s stagflationary period, what is stagflation? Let me just add for, for the viewers is a period of high inflation, low economic growth, but high unemployment as well. 
So again, that's part of my 2020 forecast that we see deflation 2020, high inflation 21, 22, and then stagflation 23 to 24, maybe, maybe beyond. So when you look at that, what actually performs best in a period of stagflation, it is gold, silver, and farmland. Those are the only three things that have been proven every single time to work in a period of stagflation. Gold, silver, farmland. Because you can produce the food to keep people alive. <clears throat> now, you keep saying that we're seeing the same timelines going out to 2030. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, what's the transition then at that point? Is it everything has run its course on the collapse phase and then it, it's set to reset on a, on a new asset class or new pillars of a, of a new economy that are put in place, carbon trading credits, carbon allocation credits, gold, silver, crypto, digitization of forests and uh, ecosystems? Or what is it, yeah. a magic 2030 date? It's not anywhere you can't find it now. They always peg that 2030, 2031, and then we enter something new. Is mm. it a cosmic cycle? Is it an energy cycle? Is it a shift in human perception? Or is it truly just... It's about the money and everything ran out of its uh, final value and we have to start again. Yeah, well, short answer, I have no idea. I don't know what will happen at 2030. But I do know by that point, we will be in some sort of a new cycle. Um, and all the dates line up to that as well. It's the, the late 2020s through to about 2030. So we'll be in this new cycle. Now, that isn't what worries me. What worries me is the fourth turning part of the cycle before we go into the first um, section again. Because if you look at these fourth turnings, the final part is always chaos. There is always military conflict and war. There's always some sort of famine. There is always mass amounts of death. That is what is a little more concerning to me. But as I mentioned to you offline, I have my plan for that. So I'm not really concerned for me or my family um, at all. Very, very, that much concern. But I am concerned for everyone else. And that's why I tried to, like yourself, David, try to educate everyone, try to just give this guidance and help. And you know it as well. A lot of people will listen and they'll say, this guy's crazy. He's a whatever. And he's nuts. And, you know, he talks garbage. And, he should be banned from YouTube. And, you know, you get all these wild comments. But um, that's all we can do, really, is just educate people. People can take what they like, dump what they don't like. And that's the way I see my, my role, really. And I, I was so committed to that. I left my previous job role, which was a very good role, in order to do my YouTube full time so that I could, you know, really, really do this and help a lot of people with it. And but yeah, getting back to the 2030 cycle, I don't know, but I know I hit upon something when I was one of the first people to do the Great Reset coverage. And I made that video. It was instantly banned. My channel was blacklisted. I had I had I was attacked by all the mainstream media outlets. The BBC did a feature on me. I mean, you don't do that. I mean, this is just PR 101. You you don't do that unless something has been exposed that you don't want coming out. So I thought about what I talked about there. And I realized it was the, the, the latter part of the video where I talked about the central bank digital currency and how this was going to come about. And at that point, no one was talking about CBDCs. It was a conspiracy theory. There was no such thing. It was never going to happen. But when I did that and I touched upon it and it was all about climate change. That's how they phrased it all, that the whole thing was about climate change. So I did this investigation and I found out every single one of these organizations is a bank or financial institution that's committed to climate change and all this stuff. And I went, it doesn't make any sense. Why would they care? Uh, a company is a, is a for-profit organization. They don't care about the climate. Their share, they care about their shareholders and profit. That's it. They, they don't care about anything else. So I knew there was something fishing. And it all ties in again with this same timeline towards 2030 with the carbon credits, with the carbon net zero, ESG, environmental, social governance, 
and with a central bank digital currency. And with, again, these three letter organizations, I think we're going to move towards somewhat of a central bank of central banks. Now, we already have that. We have the BIS, Bank of International Settlements. But I think there's going to be something similar to that or the IMF or something who are just going to take control. And I don't know what that could look like. And an extreme view I could throw out there was you could see a one world currency, a digital currency, the one coin to rule them all like the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you know, it could be something like that. I, I don't know. These are just theories I have, but we'll see as time goes by um, how these play out. It does seem when you're sort of over the target or there's a message that's being released too early, they hit you. But now if you look, central bank digital currencies, no problem. You can talk about crypto and CBDCs all day long. Great reset. Oh, just let's review the book online here. Nobody cares anymore. But when you're the first mover on that information, when it's a little too early to let it go out public, because it seems like this information release is also on a schedule for a certain effect in the society, problem, reaction, solution, that if you spill the beans a little too early, they have to rein back your message so not enough people or not a lot of people see it. Mm. So let me ask you about, you see cycles, I see cycles. So how many cycles do you think are intertwining at this moment that we're entering into here? Because for me, I got the grand solar minimum cycle. We got the 11 year solar cycle. Uh, we got the 400 year uh, turning in addition to the fourth turning. So there's you know a couple four or five that I see in earnest that are here. I'm not willing to go back and say we're entering a 12,500 year younger Dryas impact thing or a magnetic field reversal at 42,000 years. Not willing to go on that deep of a cycle intertwine, but we do see a fair few overlapping right now. Mm, yeah, and you're right. See, I, I, I look at it in the same way you do, but I look at it more on a, a granular level. So I look at it in terms of crises and I look at the convergence of crises. And that's, and that's what I tend to focus on as opposed to the bigger overall cycles. Because bottom line, I, I know that we're in this, this fourth stage of the cycle right now. That's where we are. And I know that. So do I need to look at some of the other cycles? Not really, because it won't make any difference for me to put my energy into it. But what will make a difference is looking into the different crisis periods, the different crises, and then looking at those overlaps and seeing how they're going to come together and what might happen as a result. Now, I remember when I covered Russia and what would happen when all these crises converge with Russia. And that was a very, very interesting video, a very popular video as well, um, because it did foretell a lot of the things that I hadn't even thought about. And they sort of came together during the video, which was very, very interesting pattern. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of things coming together all at the same time. Food, energy, inflation, monetary. So we've got this financial, major financial issue where things are going to collapse. And again, let's go back to my 2020, 2021 forecast. NASDAQ to go first, cryptocurrency to go second the greater stock markets to go third, where we'd see a decline bear market, then we might see, and I'm not 100% sure, but we might see a sort of run up later on once they see, okay, this is not working, raising interest rates, thing, it's not working, it's, it's in a bear market, it's going down. Let's do one last blast and let's see if we can pump it up. We might see that, I don't know. Or we could just see it run down and just keep running down. What goes after that? Well, if they keep raising interest rates, the base rate, you're going to see the housing market come down. So that is really the way I see it. It's a four-stage approach. And again, I won't get too technical on it all, but it all involves liquidity um, and credit. So most people think of money as money, but it's not. It's currency. And more than 95% of all of that currency is debt. This is why I say to people, don't leave all your money in the bank if they make mortgages and loans and credit cards. And because when everything starts collapsing down, it's, it's known as the great deleveraging happens every couple hundred of years. That's why people don't talk about it because it's not a known concept. But in the great deleveraging, all of the debt collapses upon itself. It just gets written off. And it also links in with some periods of hyperinflation. 
So you just see everything collapsing upon itself. You go to the bank for your money. Sorry, we lent it out on a mortgage and that mortgage collapsed. Sorry, we lent it to that business. That business collapsed. It's no longer there. You could look at it another way. It's the greatest opportunity in human history because we can see these cycles converging. We have more interconnectivity. You can see the cycles play out. And then you could take advantage of that. So do you think crypto might rebound after this or is it all gone into the muck and we just know there's going to be a few surviving coins and that's it? Yeah, so I, I, I own crypto. So full disclosure, I own crypto. Yeah, so do I. Yeah. Full disclosure and- too. <laughs> yeah. And I mainly focus on big projects or what I do is I apply the same methodology to crypto as I do to the stock market. So certain projects I hold is because I've done fundamental analysis on those projects. So what do they solve in the real world? Is it just a meme coin? I don't touch those, even though, yeah, OK, I'm sure I could have made loads of money on Doge and things like that. I don't touch them because they don't solve a real world problem. So what I focus on is is crypto that solve real world problems. And and I think they're going to have a big impact in the future. But I only go for large market cap and and things like that. I don't I don't speculate on things. Because you mentioned crypto diving down, you know, that being the next uh, shoe to drop, if you will. And Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are going to no, it's not coming back. But, you know, I do. I don't know. I'm just trying to get a little more insight. You yeah. know, obviously, yeah. it's going to rip down a little bit further, even I, I do believe. But then, you know, it, will there be a rebound? And when might be the question? Well, I think that everything might move in tandem. Then if they all hit the bottom and as you're staying in a step down fashion, then they might start coming back up again in that same step up fashion. Yeah, well, it's hard to know because you've got too many variables. And again, a lot of people say they know and they're an expert on it. But I could tell you some stories about experts that I've mentored who, who are in crypto and they don't know. I, I can I can tell you that. So here's a couple of ways it could play out. We keep going lower, but they, there's always a support level in any asset. There's always a support level and there's always a hardcore as well of people who just will not sell no matter what price it goes down to. So you're always going to have a support level, especially in Bitcoin. Oh, we use the keyword on the video. <laughs> so you're always going to see safe that. now. We can talk about that. That's a proof oh, right. language now. But yeah, with, with, the, with the crypto angle, you're going to see a support. And then here's, here's what one or two things will happen. 90% of the projects will die. They'll just go to the dirt and disappear. And then new, you know, all the latest new projects will come along and they'll grow again. So that's one aspect of it. But how long will that take? It could take years. It could be in this bear market for years and just sit there. Another theory is that what if people start worrying and panicking? Oh, we're losing all of our money. And it's a you know middle to younger generation. Well, they might see some crypto projects as a safe haven. I don't know. I'm not sure because I don't know the psychology of what people will do in this new environment, because we've never had this as an asset class before. If you can even call it an asset class, some people will, some people won't, you know, we'll always get disagreement on that. So that's one way you could, you could see it go. We could also see it getting so highly regulated that people just, ah, you could lose some of the support levels in it because some people are just like, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. How did the Romans achieve some of the things they achieved? They put such high taxes on it to the point where some farmland was 90% tax that the people walk away from their farms. Ah, it's not worth it. Give up the land, let it go fallow. So you could see, again, it's the same principles and concepts throughout history over and over and over again. So you could see something like this occur with, with crypto as well. There's There's so many... There's so many different things. The, the bottom line for me is I don't really care what happens because I only put in money into speculative things like crypto, for example, that I can afford to lose. If it went to zero, it wouldn't affect my life in any way. It's just uh, that's uh, that's not good. <laughs> Lost a bit of money there. But, you know, that's the way I see it, some of these things. I, I don't I don't necessarily see it as this is a big long term investment for me. 
right now where I see my investment in precious metals and farmlands. That's what I see as investments. An important part here as we sign off today, uh, keeping a little bit of precious metals so you can exchange that into whatever the value might be if it's hyperinflating to be able to pay your property tax. Because in the States here, that's one way that they were getting away with theft, legal theft of a lot of farmland and property was the non-payment of property taxes during the Great Depression. People could not pay. So the banks would foreclose. And then they had something called the penny sale where the whole community would turn up and the bankers, if somebody else were to bid in, they got taken off and beaten off to the left over there to a pulp. And the farmer would usually try to buy their land back for pennies on the dollar at that point. But that was a rare occasion that it really worked that smoothly. Most times people had lost their land simply for, at that time, a few dollars of non-payment of property tax. So to be able to hold even a a silver coin that might get you through on the exchange rate in a hyperinflationary environment to be able to pay your property taxes and then keep your land. But Neil, thanks for coming on. I, uh, I what do you think about that idea? Because precious metals, I'm a fan. You know, it's been like that for what six, seven thousand years. It hasn't failed us yet. Mm -hmm. Every uh, fiat currency has collapsed, and we don't know about crypto just yet. But the land is still here. The earth is still spinning, and I know that farmland will be here too. Yeah, and the ability to grow food and feed people. That's going to be a big one. So, uh, yeah. any last thoughts for us? Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. The way I'm telling, again, my community at the moment, and we've been pretty good throughout the last couple of years. We, we have done well. We did well on silver. See, silver's my thing, David. I'm very good at analyzing silver and predicting it. It was around, again, that period, I think it was March or April, when I saw the gold to silver ratio whoosh, go up to 100 and. I saw it go through the roof. I saw it go to 115 and I just went pretty much all in on silver at that point because I, I, I knew just from knowing the charts that silver had to go up at least 50%. But then when it went to 125, I'd already put all my money in so I couldn't get a better rate, but went to 125 to one ratio and then silver followed shortly after it went up 100%. So I, I do agree with you that, that there are patterns. You can see the patterns um, through all these things. But yeah, tangible assets, my friends, that's what you need during periods like this. It is tangible assets. If it's digital or if it's in the bank or it's uh, some of you know, tech stocks and you know, growth stocks and stuff like this and bonds and all these other things, you know, I would say you may have a difficulty in the future. If we see a great deleveraging pattern, like we mentioned, you might have a, a bit of difficulty getting access to these digital, because that's what they are. They are digital ownership rights of um, what we could say tangible assets, but they are, they are really digital, digital assets that you own right now, uh, even if they do represent physical, tangible assets. So yeah, Anything physical, anything tangible, these have always done well in periods of uncertainty, and they'll always do well in the future, in my opinion. I wish I had a time machine so I could jump into the future and see how they wrote about this period, even though we lived through it. I'm wondering mm -hmm. what they would say and how it'll play out and if they get the truth, because, you know, the victory or, you know, truth is written by the victors. So I wonder yeah. how much of the past is really going to repeat or what we really know about the past. But that's a, that's a subject for a different time. And I'd be way off on a tangent on that. So anyway, hopefully everybody got something that you can use to take forward, especially this weekend. We're coming up to the weekend. So think about what you can plant, what you can get ready for your garden, what seeds you could buy. Think into the next year's planting. It might not be so incredibly important right this second. Although if you do see the future, you would know that it is. You need to practice this year. Make your mistakes now when it's not really that critical for you and your families, but then, you know, plan for next planting season and get out in the store and see what's there. Talk to a couple of people, learn a little more about taking food growing into your own, you know, decentralization is your own home garden and I'll, and I'll leave it there. But Neil, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. You're most welcome, David. And uh, for everyone watching, you know, thanks for watching. Really appreciate you. I'm sure David appreciates you as subscribers. And uh, yeah, feel free to come over, check out the Great Depression Diaries that I did. You will love those um, videos. It was 
so much work and you'll see the amount of work that went into it just when you see the, the diary. So, all right. Yeah. Take care. And thanks. And I'll put those links in the description box below so you can go over to Neil McCoy Ward's YouTube channel and click on that. That way you don't have to search for it in the uh, description or the videos or the playlist. So I'll just link it below, click and go. And anyway, thanks for your time and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Yeah.